Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, should work, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, welcome to this uh, second lecture of this lecture series on um, active particles. So um, yesterday I showed you the, the simplest realistic model, which was the active Brownian particle. And I tried to contrast it with kind of naive toy approaches like the active montagne Uhlenbeck particle. So the active Brownian particle, this is really the work for all, for all synthetic active particles. I didn't have time to show you the part on bacteria where you have to use run and tumble motion, but Christina Kurztaler uh, wrote me an email yesterday. She will give a presentation next week. Um, and so she will catch up with this. So she will talk about the run and tumble motion there. So today we want to elaborate on the models and um, make, make them a little bit more complicated. And okay, you've seen this slide yesterday. So these were our self-propelled agents that have different um, self-propelling mechanisms. We are interested in the artificial ones. So say the Janus particles uh, for which we found that the ABP model is an accurate, it's an accurate description. Um, however, there's one aspect missing. I told you this model is complete. You add only one, uh, one additional slow time scale. This is the time scale for reorientation and all other spells and whistles you should forget like velocity fluctuations, height fluctuations uh, on, the, on the glass plate and so on. Yes, you can forget about this. But there's one, one more feature that we should take into account and this is uh, shown here in this experiment. So if you have, say, E. coli bacteria, then we know they, these are driven by this flagella-like flagella motion where you, uh, by the fact, flagella rotates. And what happens now, if you bring these particles uh, close to a, a surface, then the hydrodynamic flow will induce a back coupling. Yeah? So you're, I mean, this is like swimming in a pool and you come close to the border. So yeah, you are kind of emitting vortices while swimming and these vortices come to the wall and come back and you will interact with them. And what happens here is then you notice that your flagella motion uh, gives rise to a chirality and these, um, these uh, E. coli bacteria will start swimming in circles. Yeah? So they start swimming in circles. I mean, uh, there's a lot, a lot more to say. These are genetically engineered ones. So usually they wouldn't do that. They would reorient, but these, this is suppressed here. So there's one new mechanism that uh, rather than going straight, so I said the active Brownian particle is the drunk driver that goes straight and the wheel starts shaking. But there's no reason why initially or why the normal position of the wheel should be where you go straight. It could be tilted a little bit, so, and then you go in circle and then you start shaking the wheel around this tilt. So we have to expand our mathematical description uh, for the angular motion. So this theta is the orientation of the particle. This we already had, that was the orientational diffusion. And I add one more parameter, this omega for the angular drift, uh, uh, angular drift velocity. So omega is the angular drift. And I try to make some animation here. So you see the particle is moving still with constant velocity, but now it does this kind of circular motion. Yeah? So it goes in circles. This motion is perturbed due to orientational diffusion. I suppressed any translational diffusion. So it goes constant velocity here, but it essentially goes in circles. So this is the pattern that we Excuse see here. Me, um, sir, yeah. Yeah, you are talking about the hydrodynamic coupling, right? Yeah. So is there any background flow? Yeah, you flows, but I don't describe the flows. Yeah, so I have um, effective models. So I would just want to describe the phenomenon. I'm not talking about the fluid velocity or anything. I'm just saying, how can I incorporate these effects in the model that I have a drift? Yeah, so you are right, of course, from a microscopic or more microscopic perspective, I should solve. Um, uh, so this was shown yesterday in, in one of the presentations. I should solve the Stokes equations coupled to our particle and coupled to a surface and so on. This gets all very complicated. You can do this in principle. Here, I'm just doing a phenomenological point of view. And so how can I add a simple term in my Langevin equation? Uh, so that's the point of view. And of course, the drawback is 
I have no clue what, what that omega is, how this depends on the distance to the walls, how this depends on the shape of the particle and so on. Yeah, this I lose, but this is this is what I did before. So I also don't know what the what the rotational diffusion coefficient is and so on. This is these are effective model parameters that you have to fit to the data at the end. Okay. Thank you. Yeah? So in principle you're right, you can do this, but this is way more complicated. Okay, so the setup is now shown here. So we have the active Brownian particle that we upgrade to a circle swimmer. So what does the particle do? So the particle goes, has an active propulsion with constant velocity. In addition to that constant velocity, so the, but this velocity, the vector of velocity rotates because we have angular diffusion. Um, and we have this angular drift. So the, the drift goes here to the left. And in addition to the fixed velocity, you may add new velocities due to random motion translational motion, which may be different perpendicular and parallel to the current axis. And a setup is shown here. So here we have a bunch of particles that all start here with this uh, at the same point, all in this, uh, looking in the same direction. And then I let the dynamics run. So you see on average, they follow this kind of uh, circle here, uh, but um, the probability cloud gets spread. So the different colors are different times. So there's a spread because the orientation is spread, but also the diffusion, translational diffusion may set it. So and here by this mechanism, you spread your probability. Okay, so these are, this is uh, the summary. So this is the comment that you made before. So it ignores uh, any microscopic origins of this propulsion or the angular drift or the translational diffusion. So this is a simplistic model. Um, Again, by uh, dimensional analysis, maybe you should uh, start with this time if, uh, if here. So there are, this should be d rot. So there is a time scale, the persistent time. Uh, this is uh, one over d rot. This is a time scale where you essentially, well, not go straight, but you go along a circular arc. Then we have from this, you can uh, derive a persistence length. And the new parameter that comes in is, is by this omega, that t would be the period that you need to go to, to a complete a complete circle. Yeah? Okay, so how do we? Uh, how uh, what is now the full description? So this slide you have essentially seen before. So for the angular motion, we just add here this angular drift, and the translational motion still has the fixed velocity with a uh, with an orientation that changes in time. And in addition, we have translational noise. So recall, the orientation is parametrized in the angle theta that undergoes this random motion here. The noise terms, this eta and zeta, are independent of each other. Zeta is a, um, a wide noise term with the strength of the rotational diffusion coefficient. And this eta, um, uh, so i and j are Cartesian components. This is also delta correlated, but the strength depends on your current orientation. So it's different parallel and perpendicular to uh, to the current axis. You again count the number of, of parameters that goes in, so omega, v, d rot, d perp, d parallel. So the first that you, see, you can see, there's a translational anisotropy, and you can do a mean diffusion coefficient here. Um, by pure dimensional analysis from this mean diffusion coefficient and this rotational, you can extract a length scale, and I introduced funny factors here in such a way that this length scale corresponds just to the radius of a particle in case you have a passive um, a passive spherical colloid. Yeah? But so so there so this is kind of misleading because in the model there's no geometric size of the particle. This doesn't even enter. Yeah? Similar if you write down Newton's equation, mass times its force, you don't know anything about the size of the because Newton treats everything as point particles, forgetting about the size. Yeah? So that's the same spirit here. So we have this characteristic length, um, and then you, uh, you can uh, make different dimensional parameters. One is the anisotropy, just as yesterday. The important one is the Piclean number, which is the driving force, how much we drive our system out of equilibrium. And then we have a new parameter, which compares the angular drift with this rotational diffusion coefficient. This is the, what we call the quality factor. So this is essentially the numbers of circles that you complete before your motion gets randomized. Yeah? So for high quality factor, 
you essentially go only in circles for a long time. Yeah. Okay. Good. Now um, I do repeat the exercise from yesterday. So forget about the, the displacement. Let's have a look at the angular motion only. So I'm looking at the conditional probability. So what is the probability to find an orientation theta after lag time t, provided I started with an initial orientation of theta zero? And this fulfills a diffusion equation. So you see now I corrected what I messed up yesterday. So the first term is just angular diffusion. And in addition to this, we get this angular drift. So we have an angular drift. And this, uh, this is again very easy to solve. So this is, um, this is the same equation as yesterday. So this exponential, this Gaussian, solves the diffusion equation. And the omega t I just entered, uh, enters here. And this, so this is an angular drift. So you see, if this d rod becomes very small, this becomes a sharp Gaussian uh, where the theta is close to theta zero plus omega t. Yeah? So, so we have this drift term. And I accounted also for the fact that theta is a two pi periodic variable. So rather than having just a, a one Gaussian, I just continued this periodically by adding this term two pi n and sum over all n. So you can easily check that this solves the diffusion equation and it reduces to a delta function in the orientation for small times. And rather than doing this, uh, this one in the thetas directly, since this is a two pi periodic function, both in theta zero and in theta, you can also make a Fourier expansion. So, and this is done here. So this is the Fourier expansion. So it's sum over all news. So you see, this is the complex exponential, both in theta and theta zero. And this is the solution. And again, you can plug it in and see that it fulfill, uh, satisfies the drift diffusion equation. Now, um, now you can calculate certain correlation functions. So we need only correlation functions that respect the two pi periodicity of our um, observables. So the most general is just one compact complex exponential with some mu and another complex exponential with some mu. What does this uh, bracket here mean? Well, it means we have to, uh, we have to average over the, in, uh, so, okay, we take an initial value of theta zero, then we ever multiply it with this factor here. Then we let time evolve, which gives us the probability to find theta. So I weigh my result with the one quantity that I want. And at the end, I average over all initial orientations. That's why I have this factor one over two pi. And I sum over all final orientation because I don't care anymore. So this is the definition of the correlation function. And then it's an easy exercise to come from this equation to this one here. So you see all correlation functions are of this type. They're still diagonal in what I call the mode indices, mu and nu. And this is just a, a, an oscillating complex exponential. So the new term is this one here. Before it was just a relaxing exponential. Now it has this complex exponential here. So for example, if I take mu equal to nu equal to one, then this, uh, and take the real part, you get here just a damped, damped uh, this is like a damped oscillator, damped harmonic oscillator. Okay, so the orientation, uh, uh, the orientation and correlation uh, disappears on the time scale of t rod. Yeah? Okay, now let's have a look again at the mean square displacement. This is our first indicator, or even make it simpler. So the increment, this is of course the uh, increment. This is the displacement uh, uh, between time zero and time uh, time t. So I just integrate my Langevin equation. So the Langevin equation. Um, no, the, the Langevin equation, let's look at this again. Here, this is the Langevin equation, take the x component. So we have v cosine and then add the x. And I integrate from zero to t. Of course, you can do, do the same for the y component. Um, then, you see, uh, then you see that, okay, um, on, on average, this vanishes. Um, this is clear by isotropy. So the first non-trivial thing is the mean square displacement. So I square this. By basically just copy pasting it and replacing t prime by t double prime. Then you see there's a term v squared cosine squared. There's a term eta x times eta x. And the same for the y component, this is sine times sine and eta y y. Now, after averaging, you see, ah, this is, oh, this is just, I can use a trigonomic trick rule. So a trick rule, and this is the cosine of the relative angle. 
now you go back. This is just the real part of this correlation function with mu and mu equal to one. So I can read off the result and plug this in. So this is the result. So it's an exponential decorated with a cosine. And the last here, this we already had yesterday. So the two terms magically add up that the anisotropy, anisotropy drops out. And this is just delta correlated with the mean diffusion. Now it's a little bit more tedious to do the integral. I don't do this here. So I, used, I, give, uh, I admit that I use Mathematica, but you can do it on, on your own. It takes some time. So the result is already a little bit lengthy. So the first term is trivial. This is just a translational diffusion that we put in. But there's a coupling now between the rotational diffusion time and this, uh, this omega, this angular drift. Uh, so that's the long formula. For long times, um, this term and I think this term and this term, they dominate, yeah? And they add up to something that the mean square displacement increases linearly at long times with an effective diffusion coefficient that is composed of the translational, mean translational diffusion and some funny combination of the rotational and the velocity. So we recover the result from yesterday by just uh, putting omega, z omega to zero. And you can see this is all, was already more difficult than yesterday. And you can try to go up to higher moments to, um, to the fourth moment. This is what Christina Kotzthaler did in her PhD. The result fills something like a page. You can do it, yeah? or Mathematica can do it. And here are some examples of the mean square displacement. So I measure again everything in terms of the persistence length, time in terms of this rotational diffusion. Then you see this is the result for infinite Piclean number. That is, I forget about any translational diffusion. Um, I start with, uh, with quality factor zero, that is without drift. So and then this reproduces the result from yesterday. So initially we have directed persistent motion. And at time scale t rod, you lose your orientation and you cross over to ordinary diffusion. Now let's switch on the angular drift. Yeah? So, so first of all, you see that the angular drift um, suppresses the effective diffusion. That's clear because you are forced to go in circles, so you don't get very far. And if the quality factor becomes even large at this eight here, you see that this mean square displacement starts oscillating. And this is rather clear, so I, let me make a drawing. So I start here, and then I essentially go along a circle. And you see the mean square displacement increases first and then it decreases again. Yeah? So this is just a circular motion and by orientational diffusion, it gets blurred. I should mention this is, yeah, so this is without translation. And in fact, this, this dashed line that is shown here is, um, is uh, the pure, the, so this is a pure circular motion without any orientational diffusion. So if you now switch on the translational diffusion, so you jiggle around a little bit more uh, beyond what we add, then you see the picture prevails, but these oscillations get kind of washed out. Yeah? So they get washed out because every, the picture is just blurred. And if the Pickley number becomes really small, then, then um, this feature gets even blurred out even more. Yeah? Ah, this is, oh, say, this is the formula. So this is the distance. Uh, for a pure circle, this is what I kind of tried to draw here. So after, so the maximal distance is after half the period, and then it goes down again. So this is the motion here. Um, you, uh, the radius r is just the velocity divided by the angular. Um, and in all curves, you see that we have an um, uh, we have a long time diffusion uh, uh, increase, a linear increase with this effective diffusion, as we saw. Or here, there's a different way to write this formula. So in dimensional units, so you have the defect, effective diffusion in terms of the mean diffusion. Ah, there should be, sorry, there shouldn't, okay, there should be equal to one plus. So I have to correct this. So this is one without driving and the quality of, I think this should be also M squared. So I, okay, I have to correct this formula. Um, there's a different way, to, I will correct this formula. Here. This is, but this is the correct. Okay. Um, so we have enhanced diffusion. So the diffusion is enhanced by the active propulsion. 
But if you force the, uh, the particle onto circles, then you suppress this enhancement. Okay. Now, um, um, the next uh, indicator is the non-Gaussian parameter. So that's the first quantity describing the deviation from Gaussian behavior. It's essentially the ratio of the fourth moment of the displacement divided by the second moment. And these factors are made in such a way that if you had a Gaussian process, then this would evaluate to zero. This is why it's called non-Gaussian parameter. So any value different from zero tells you that it's non-Gaussian. Now, um, okay, so the, you can do it analytically. And as I said, the formula is lengthy. It fills in a higher age. So I don't show you the formula. And the behavior is like this. So initially here, at infinite Pickley number, it looks Gaussian, then it oscillates. And then, sorry, it's not starting off, it starts from minus uh, one half. And then for long times, it goes to zero. And this is for all Pickley numbers. This is clear for long times. You expect that the motion gets randomized. And on long time scale, everything looks just like Brownian motion. Yeah? So if you're beyond the persistence line the time, if you're uh, below, beyond the rotation diffusion time, uh, then everything should get blurred. And you see, indeed, this is the time scale where things die out. Um, without any noise, without any noise, the, uh, again, you have the deterministic motion. And for this, uh, for this, you can readily calculate the, um, the non-Gaussian parameter. This is minus one half. This is, uh, this is just the value that you see here for um, infinite Picklin number. If you have a finite Picklin number, then at short times, the translational diffusion becomes more important. So, um, so you see there's a so it, I think at very small times, it should, it should go to zero, but I don't know. So it, it takes some time so un, until you re-approach this minus one half as for the infinite decay number, and then we relax le, we to zero. These oscillations here are, again, due to the circular motion. Ah, so here, okay, this is the initial value. Uh, it, it depends on the um, anisotropy. Okay. But what we really want to know what we really want to know is spatial temporal information. Yeah, so this means great displacement, and this non-Gaussian parameter provide you only with temporal information. We want spatial temporal information. We want to look at our object at a certain length scale or time scale. That is, we are interested in the say in the uh, in the uh, propagator in this conditional probability density. What is the probability to displace by an increment r? Finding a final orientation theta after lag time t, provided we started with an initial orientation theta zero. And again, yeah. To interrupt, I just can you just uh, clarify the so definitions of Packley number for this drifting model versus the one you did yesterday? Can you just clarify which were the this is what exactly. I was trying to do right now. So, uh, so you can interrupt any time if you want. So, so the uh, so you have seen this equation yesterday. Uh, so this was the orientational diffusion. Yeah, so it's the orientational diffusion. Then we have this coupling to the displacement via this active propulsion, and this was the anisotropic diffusion. And the new term is this one here. This is the angular drift, and also the first two terms you have seen. Uh, for the pure orientational motion where I didn't talk about the displacement. So this is the new term here. This is the one that we didn't have yesterday. Does this answer your question? Uh, so Peckley number here equals? The Peckley number v. comes in, in this velocity v. Yeah? So, so v is and the Peckley number This is proportional to each other. Here I write down the, the, the form that has dimensions, but you can write these equations in a I mentioned this form. I think this will come a little bit later. So this is this is essentially the quality factor. This is the Pecklin number. Uh, this has something to do with the anisotropy and the mean diffusion. That's true. Yeah, you can dimensionalize it, yeah, so you can make it dimensionless by using time scales in terms of tau, tau rot. By, so by using time scale tau, tau, tau rot, 
then um, the angle is dimensionless anyway. So you divide the entire equation by d rot. Yeah, this you can do. Then you have a dimensionless time here, t, where the t times d rot. Then you have omega divided by d rot. This is essentially, this is 2 pi, the quality factor, 2 pi m. Then we have the velocity. So we divide the velocity by d rot. So that's not entirely the Peckley number, but almost. And um, yeah, so and this may be a little bit more complicated. Yeah? So indeed, you are right. It's a smart idea to make everything dimensionless. But I like to start with something that has physical units and make then the step on the after. Yeah? But we will do that. Yeah? So the complicated. So the so without the translation, this part we already solved. And the problem is now that the orientation and the translation couple to each other via the active propulsion and the anisotropic diffusion, if you want. Again, the system is translationally invariant, so it doesn't matter where you start your motion. It's only the increment matter. I've anticipated this already by saying, so saying kind of you start at R0 R0 or R is just the displacement from your initial position. Yeah? So this I anticipated already. And whenever this is the case, you, it's a good idea to do a Fourier transform, a spatial Fourier transform. So this P tilde is the spatial Fourier transform, just like yesterday. Um, and in uh, this P tilde now satisfies the following equation. All these spatial derivatives are just replaced by minus IK. And this is the equation that I showed you yesterday, except for this new term here. So what we are really interested in is not the entire propagator because it depends on many parameters. So let's do um, the intermediate scattering function, which is this object here. This is something that you can measure, as I told you, and I showed you yesterday images, but it nicely fits the model. So what we want is the average of this exponential for a given wave vector k. How do I do this average? Well, I have to average this exponential and then integrate over all r. This is already done in this p tilde. Um, I average over the initial angle. This is this. That's why I weight with the initial. Uh, they are all random initially. They are all equal. And then I sum up over all final angles. So this is the definition of the intermediate scattering function in terms of this p tilde. And p tilde is just this one. So basically, it's free integral. But you see, p tilde is simpler than this because here there are no spatial derivatives. Now. We're using the same method as yesterday. This is similar to a Schrodinger equation. So let's do a separation ansatz. Also, so the first thing I do is I choose k in the x direction. Why can I do this? Well, the model is not only translationally invariant, but also rotationally invariant. Yeah? So you can just as an experimentalist, you can just rotate your table, and then the experiment is still the same. So I know that I can choose my coordinate system, whatever I like. So I put this in the x direction and I arrive at this equation here, which I showed you yesterday, except for this new term here for the angular drift. And again, I use a separation ansatz. So I make a time dependent function times some angle dependent function. If you put this in, it's clear that the time dependence is an, it's an exponential and you arrive at the following eigenvalue problem. So zeta of the z, z of Theta is the eigenfunction. Um, lambda is the eigenvalue from uh, this is the separation constant. And you have to solve this equation. Now you can read this again as a Sturm Liouville problem, which has now cosine and cosine squared. This is mm, to make it look more like the Mathieu equation. I again do the substitution x is theta over 2. And then this, uh, this looks like an eigenvalue problem where L is some uh, operator, it's a non hermitian operator, A is an eigenvalue, and the Storm Liouville operator this is this object here. Yeah? And so, so with this term, with this term here, um, we said this is the Mathieu equation, and now we have two additional terms which are, are additional deformation parameters. So the Q was the deformation parameter from yesterday. Um, it was turned out to be imaginary for our case. So up to this, these two terms, this is just the Mathieu equation. And then I have additional deformation parameters due to the uh, translational anisotropy and due to the quality factor that is the rotation of the, of the angular drift. And A is the eigenvalue of this, of this generalized Mathieu equation 
connected to the original eigenvalue. Okay, so I need to solve this eigenvalue problem. And so unfortunately, if you go through the box, that you don't find name for this equation. So what do you do? Um, uh, so you uh, go through the general theory again. So um, first I define a scalar product for functions of an angle. So between zero and pi. So it's only between zero and pi because we made this funny substitution earlier. Um, so this is a standard scalar product. And once you define the scalar product, you can define what an adjoint operator is. This is now the result for the adjoint operator. You arrive at it by just complex conjugating and taking, uh, um, uh, uh, take, uh, integrating by parts, making all derivatives x to the left. And this is the result. So unfortunately, this operator is non-hermitian. So in principle, you have to distinguish between right eigenfunctions and left eigenfunctions. So this, these are the definitions. They can be chosen to be orth orthogonal in the following sense. And once you do this and look at the special form of this operator, you see that the le left eigenfunctions are kind of trivially related to the right eigenfunction. So for general non-hermitian operator, there's of course no relation between left and right eigenfunction. But in this case, I can do this because I can expect the operator and it looks almost emission. Anyway, so the problem is if you look up this operator, you don't find a name for it. So we just define our own eigenfunctions. So we give it a new name. So our own eigenfunction, and I call these generalized Mathieu functions because Mathieu introduced one deformation parameter from cosine and sine. I introduce two more parameters to it, deform it even more. Uh, and now it's better than rather than using cosine and sine as a basis, I start from complex exponentials from the very beginning. So my functions are called EE. I need only even ones, and they are, uh, they are periodic. They're uh, periodic. In fact, they are high periodic with some expansion coefficient. So these are the eigenfunctions, and there will be deformations of a complex exponential. Um, they are. They can be chosen to be. Um, uh, sorry, this should be e. I have to correct this. So this is a copy paste error. So this is e e times e e. So they are orthogonal and normalized in the following sense. And they still have the. And this should be also e e. So this, sorry, this is a copy paste error. I will correct this and I will. Uh, I will give the slides to the organizers if they want to put them up and you then you can download the slides. Yeah? So this should be EE. -E. So again, any function that is now high periodic, so we said we had this funny substitution, can be expanded in my own Mathieu functions. And the Fourier coefficients are given by the same formula with my own Mathieu function. So this should be EE. -E. Okay. Now, in terms of these new generalized Mathieu functions, I can find the solution of my p tilde as an expansion in these eigenfunctions. So this is the final result, sum over exponentials <coughs> and these eigenfunctions. Now, we said we want to look at the intermediate scattering function. So I average over the initial angle, theta 0, and integrate over the final angle, theta. Then the result is the following. So I need certain integrals over my new functions. You can calculate, so this is essentially the zero expansion coefficient in the Fourier series of my new function, and there's also missing, it should be un. So there are quite some typos in here. It's the first time that I do this part, so there are typos. Okay, so this is the result for the intermediate scattering function. Now let's look at results. So the left-hand side is for without any angular drift, so the zero quality factor. This is precisely the image that I showed you yesterday. So the intermediate scattering function starts at one. Uh, this is how we defined it. In case to zero at long times, we have a logarithmic time scale. Um, and we see that if we, um, from a small k, it relaxes monotonically, it's almost exponential. But if I make larger k, that is I zoom in on the length scale of the persistent length, I start to see oscillations. These are these oscillations, which is the new feature of the active Brownian particle. If you switch on the translational diffusion, that is decrease the Picklin number, 
then you still see these oscillations, but they get kind of blurred. And if you would go to even, if you were to go to higher K, that is zoom in even more at smaller length scales, then the translational diffusion dominates over active propulsion and you don't see any oscillation. Now let's switch on the quality factor. So we introduced this angular drift. And then, then you see a new feature. So this is still at Pickley number infinity. You see a new feature, you get, you see oscillations here, but these oscillations are not around zero as these ones here, but they are around, well, a finite plateau or they are between one and a finite plateau. So they are oscillating in between. How can I understand that? How can I understand that? So I told you that the intermediate scattering function, since it does not depend on the direction of K because the system is isotropic, I could average the complex exponential e to the minus i k scalar delta r over all directions of k, which just yields a Bessel function. Now, in the case that I have a completely deterministic motion, so forget about any angular diffusion, about any translational diffusion, this delta r becomes a deterministic variable, just as I showed here. We start from zero, goes to a maximum, and then goes goes back to zero again. So in this case, I can, can write down what the intermediate scattering function should look like. And this is, I think, where is it? Um, I'm not sure if you can see this. This should be included in the figure somewhere. Maybe it's not, yeah? So in, uh, sorry, here, this should be these oscillations. So this should be the, so you oscillate between one, so for, um, for t equal to zero, this is one, and the maximum argument is 2k times r. So it oscillates between the value of g of 0, g0 of 0, and g0 of 2k ar. This explains the oscillation here. So this is just a manifestation of the circular motion again. Uh, so we can understand everything. Yeah, and if you switch on the translational diffusion, that is, you decrease the pick lean number, you still get a similar picture, but everything gets blurred. All oscillations get blurred, and this, this nice plateau that we kind of saw here quickly degrades by uh, additional translation diffusion. Okay, um, now this is the introduction to the next topic. We want to make it even more complicated. So this is a summary of the circle swimmer that we just discussed. Now I want to add one more feature which is gravity, uh, which is gravity. So uh, you may wonder, so I, of course we I introduced the circular swimmer with this idea of this uh, bacteria, um, but you can make artificial circle swimmers. Namely, you can design nanofabricate um, uh, objects like this L-shaped particle. Uh, so this is an L-shaped particle. So there's, of course, it's not spherically symmetric anymore. And uh, you can code one of the sides of this L-shaped particle. So you see that, um, that the propulsion force kind of pushes the particle here in the center of this coated area. But because it's L-shaped, the, um, this force does not act on the center of the particle. Well, you have to be careful what you mean with center. It's not the geometric center. It's not the center of mass, but it's the center of diffusion. But anyway, so it does not, so it kind of acts off center. So what does this propulsion force do? It pushes the particle and gives a torque. So the particle wants to rotate. Yeah? So if, so if an active particle, it wants to rotate. And once these particles rotate, they are circle swims. Yeah? So they, at the same time, while propagating, or, 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 or while doing the self-propulsion, they want to rotate. They want to undergo this circle swim. Now, I, I don't have an image of, uh, so this image looks very similar to the trajectories of the circle swimmers that I showed you earlier. Now, what they did in the experiment, so this was an experiment by the group by Clemens Bechinger in Constant, and they piled up with a simulation group in Düsseldorf of Hartmut Löwen. So the idea of the experiment was now, what is if I tilt my, my experiment? Yeah? So rather than having a, a glass plate that is, um, uh, that is horizontal, I uh, tilt it a little bit. So then what happens is that gravity acts in addition to the particle. So the gravitational force pulls on the particle. 
But again, so say if you have a force acting on this, this force may now act on the center of mass, but the center of mass may not be the same as the center of diffusion. So again, it may, this will in, induce uh, uh, a force. So in this case, it's made in such a way that if gravity acts like this, it wants to basically align the particle that it looks kind of in the horizontal way. So here it looks vertically. If a gravity pushes, there will be a torque until you align essentially with the horizontal. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, what do you mean by the center of diffusion? Um, so, um, so in general, um, so, okay. I mean, this is, this is heuristic, but the argument is something like this. Yeah. So in general, if you have, um, if you have uh, a force and a torque acting on a particle, this will result in a displacement and, a, and an orientation. So think of a classical body. Yeah? So think with a, with a classical body. So if I put a force and a torque, in general, even a force will not only displace, but rotate it. And similarly, uh, a torque will all, not only rotate a particle, but also displace it. Huh? Um, except you do, you, you act your forces and torques on the center of mass. And similarly, this, so mass doesn't play a role here anymore because we are over them. This role is taken by the diffusion uh, tensor. So in general, you have a matrix, which is called the resistance matrix, that couples the diffusion tensor. So it can be a tensor because it's different for different axes, and the orientation. Now you can do two things. You can choose your origin wherever you want. And then this, OK, maybe I should write this down. So this is heuristic, but um, so in general, you would have, say, here I have forces, fx, fy, and some torque, t. And this results in a, in a velocity, vx, vy, and in some, um, in some uh, this is now a bad symbol, in some, uh, some angular velocity, right? And in general, the, in general, there will be a matrix that couples everything to everything, right? Now, now what you can do is you can, so, okay, this is my L shape. This matrix depends on your point of reference in the system, just like for um, uh, in, in classical mechanics, you say, okay, there's, there's the moment of inertia, which is a tensor, this is in the center of mass. Yeah? And the idea was you can pick a smart coordinate, a smart coordinate in such a way that this becomes diagonal in the following sense, that translation and rotation don't couple anymore. That's the first thing I do. So by choosing my center, so my, my coordinates in a smart way, that orientation does not couple anymore to translation. And then I rotate my, then the next thing that you can do is you can rotate your coordinate system such that this becomes a diagonal matrix. And then this you would call, say, D parallel and D parallel. And this would get a name, so I am missing a name here. Yeah, this would be D dot. Sorry, I should call this mobility. So maybe one over KBT, one over KBT, D perp, and this is your. Yeah? So in this reference system, there is no coupling between translation and rotation anymore. And this is what is called the center of diffusion. Yeah? But in general, our force does not act on the center of diffusion, but kind of offline. Off, off yeah? um, and similarly, also gravity. So gravity would act on the center of mass, but this doesn't have to coincide with the center of diffusion. There's no way. So just make the left-hand side a little bit heavier. This doesn't uh, affect any of the diffusion. Yeah? So in general, gravity will also induce a torque. Well, it will induce a torque as long as, uh, as, long as your particle isn't aligned with the direction. So once you turn it, then, so if you basically have, so okay, say this is the center of diffusion, say this is the center of mass, so C, D, Dm. So when I make force goes like that, it will start rotating. But if I rotate my particle, so my particle rotates, 
much. So if we can draw this, rotate in such a way that gravity acts on an axis that connects the center of mass and the center of diffusion, then this particle doesn't want to rotate anymore, right? So that's the idea. So there's a preferred angle that the particle wants to assume such that gravity doesn't rotate it anymore. So gravity wants to align the particle with a certain direction. That's the idea. Now, here's the experiment. So, mm -hmm. so just now, like you said, that we are working in the overdamped regime. Like we are uh, working in the overdamped yeah. regime. So, like how gravity and like earlier you just said that center of mass is yeah. of no use then. But again, no, no, the center of mass, this is where the gravity acts on. So, um, so I should say, um, I should uh, make it more precise. Inertia doesn't play a role. Yeah? Inertia doesn't play a, ro a role. In that sense, the mass is irrelevant. If I'm talking about gravity, this, of course, exec exerts a force. But inertia, in terms of acceleration, is irrelevant. But the force that's acted by gravity, that's still relevant. Yeah? So there's a force just by gravity. And this force acts on the center of mass. And if this doesn't coincide with the center of diffusion, it will try to rotate the particle. So basically, like when we are saying overdamped regime, then while solving only for the acceleration term, we neglect that. No, I'm, I'm not talking about any acceleration. So you see, okay, if you go back to classical mechanics, then there are, you start with two masses. Yeah? So there's, in principle, there's the inertial mass that's responsible for inertial forces, and there is the heavy mass that is responsible for gravity. And the magic element of Newton's theory is that heavy mass and inertial mass is the same. This magic element is got only removed by Einstein's relativity, general relativity. But here, what I'm talking about is the, inertia, uh, is the heavy mass. And of course, there are forces by gravity, uh, but there's no, there's, uh, all inertial terms can be forgotten. Huh? So still, I mean, so, um, if you think of the exper experiment that Juliane was talking about, of course, if you have a colloidal suspension, then gravity still plays a role because heavier particle will be dragged to the ground, although inertial forces don't play a role at all. Yeah? So gravity is relevant, and the experimentalists have usually very nice tricks to suppress gravity by, <laughs> by um, density matching the colloids, for example. No, you don't do that because you live in the 2D, maybe. Okay, so, in, in, so they, this can be done. That, so if you match the density of the solvent to the density of the colloids, then, then basically there's no, there's no buoyancy anymore. Um, but in my case, I I'm, I'm actually want to take advantage of gravity until just the experiment. Huh? Okay, thank Good. you, sir. Good, so now here are typical trajectories for different angles. And I always have to think how it starts. Yeah? So for small angle, for small angle, the typical trajectory is that the particle has this Rosetta-like motion. So it looks like it's reminiscent of the circular motion that we had in the planar case. Yeah? Without gravity, you expect a circle swimmer. So this looks like a, a circular motion with a drift motion superimposed, right? And if I increase the, if I increase the angle, that is, I make gravity stronger, the following happens. The curves, the trajectories are almost straight, so the particles don't rotate anymore, and they even go upwards against gravity, which is amazing. Yeah? If you think so, they go upwards. Um, there's no paradox because they are not in equilibrium and they're self. So it appears, and this, these are so, and this is what they did in this experiment, and they gave some explanations for that, or they can reproduce by simulation some of these features. So in my words, now there is a transition between a phase where the orientation is, uh, is periodic, where it rotates, and a phase where the orientation is locked. And the goal now is to go into details of this transition. Okay. Now, um, let's strip all bells and whistles of the model of uh, um, uh, Verhagen. 
uh, of Ten Hagen and uh, uh, what they did. So I simplify a little bit. This doesn't affect the general picture. You can do it in the full model, but uh, I try to keep it simple. So the equation of motion for the translation is just, I have just active propulsion and I forget about any, uh, any translational diffusion. Uh, also, I forget about any mobility of the um, the angular motion is what we had before. So this is the angular drift because there's an L-shaped particle that wants to rotate. There's noise, and there's a new term now: gamma sine times sine theta, because so gamma is essentially so it's proportional to the gravity. So this is the this is the torque that tries to align the particle. Right? Uh, so this term tries to be uh, to align the part. So this is a simplified version of the full equations of motion of Ten Hagen. And I say, this model here, this equation uh, uh, here, you may be familiar with, and if not, I'm, I'm ex explaining to it, uh, this is a paradigm actually of nonlinear physics. I call this the overdamped noisy driven pendulum. And what is the analogy here? So this equation, is essentially the overdamped version of a pendulum. So theta is the, the, re, the angle now for this pendulum. There, there are two terms in this pendulum. One is this omega, which is a motor, and the motor tries to rotate the pendulum. Uh, so there's, there's this behind the overdamped limit. So the motor try, that directly translates into angular motion. Second, there is gravity. So gravity tries to pull the, uh, the pendulum to this, this position here. So then the, now, and there's noise. So forget about the noise first. What happens now is, so you get the picture immediately. If the motor is weak, then the rest position won't be here horizontally, uh, vertically, but the motor will push it to a finite angle. Uh, to a finite angle, the motor is doing its work, and gravity is acting against it, and there will be a balance between these two forces. If the motor is so strong that the rest position goes beyond this point here, this is the point where gravity has the largest torque, then the, uh, the pendulum will start rotating because you make it over the dead point. So there's a cha qualitatively change if the motor um, uh, is strong enough. You can put it in other terms. You can say, uh, rather than discussing the motor, we discuss gravity as was in the experiment. So for small gravity, this pendulum will rotate. For uh, large gravity, there will be a rest angle. So this is discussed here. So this is a beautiful exercise in, well, it's in, in classical mechanics. So while this is overdamped, so that's probably why you didn't have it. So the, we, we keep only the angular drift and we keep the torque and this translates now in an angular motion. There's no inertia. In it. Now you see immediately that there is a locked phase. So there's a solution where theta equals to theta star um, if gravity is strong enough or if the motor is weak. Yeah? So there's one fixed point and the fixed point is just sine theta star is omega over gamma. So you see, Omega over gamma has to be smaller or equal than one. There's, of course, a second fixed point. This is just pi minus. This is theta zero. This is an unstable fixed point that corresponds to the other. Now, if this is the case, if this is the case, then there will be a constant drift velocity, even with this orientation here, and by some identities you can calculate. So this is a phase where the angle is locked. Now, if um, gamma over gamma, uh, if omega over gamma is larger than one, if this gamma is, is too small, then this, there's no solution of this anymore. So there's no fixed point. Then your pendulum will start rotating and you can at least calculate, say, the period by separation of variables. So you can calculate the period. This integral is elementary uh, and you can calculate the period. What's interesting, what you can see here already, if gravity approaches um, omega uh, from below, then this period starts to diverge. So basically, the pendulum will spend all its time close to the to the uh, to the maximal um, to the maximum um, uh, angle theta equal pi over two. Yeah? So most of the time, the pendulum will be, uh, and then it goes quickly, and again, uh, yeah. So 
This you can calculate, and you can also calculate the average velocity by just uh, solving this differential equation. So there is a bifurcation right at the point when gamma equals omega, that's the critical value. So, and it's a, actually a fold by this. Now there's a different way to, to see this problem. This is the tilted washboard potential. So I write now a potential here, then theta is just, uh, uh, it uh, has an angular drift. This depends on the potential plus noise. And the potential is calculated here. So it consists of, um, uh, of a linearly increasing potential and a modulation due to gravity. So I try to draw the potential here. And you see for, for, um, for small gravity, this potential is monotonically. And your angle will just slide monotonically down this uh, potential landscape. If gravity becomes uh, large enough, then you see there are uh, minima and maxima arising. And without noise, your particle will get stuck in one of these minima. Um, um, think of it that this has to be periodically continued. So this periodic in, uh, in theta, so if this pattern repeats, it made a blow up, but happens close to the bifurcation. So, so this gray line is where actually um, oh, this gray line is. Um, uh, close to the bifurcation where the linear term, so when uh, gamma or when gamma equals omega. So there's a barrier if gamma is larger than omega and no barrier in the, in the other case. Now, close, uh, sorry, close to this minimum, I can make now a series expansion. Yeah? So I make a Taylor expansion. There will be a quadratic expansion in this deviation from the minimum. And you see that this minimum becomes shallower and shallower if you, once you approach the bifurcation. Yeah? It becomes shallower and shallower. This is what I try to display here. So this becomes soft if gamma approaches omega from above. Um, and this is then called also the tilted washboard potential. Yeah? So it's a washboard because it has this cosine potential and tilted be due to this omega. Now, what you can calculate first is the mean motion of the particle. Since the velocity is constant, I have to calculate the mean cosine and the mean sine. These are the uh, figures here. Essentially, you can find these figures in the book of Riesken on the Fokker Planck equation, who discusses the tilted washboard potential to some extent. They are not new. Just me, let me just point out the black line here is the deterministic case without any noise. So you see the mean drift here in the cosine direction is zero. And then there is a bifurcation where the mean, uh, the mean velocity grows like a square root. And once you turn on the rotational diffusion, this picture kind of, kind of gets blurred. Similarly here, so for the sine combination, the black line, this, there's a cusp, there's a bifurcation right at gamma equal to omega. And once you turn on uh, the orientational diffusion, this picture gets blurred. This can be calculated because it's not so difficult to calculate the stationary distribution function. And once you know this, you can calculate the average. Okay. Now we want to go a step beyond that. We want to characterize the fluctuations in the system. Yeah? So we want to look at the variance. This looks almost like the mean square displacement, but it's not because there is a mean drift now. Yeah? So this is what we just calculate. So the variance is now the fluctuation around the mean. So it's not the mean square displacement, but related. So this is a fluctuation around the mean. Delta, this is the increment again. And first look at the dots. The dots are just stochastic simulations. This is what any bachelor student can do. Um, you read of that initially the variance grows as t squared. Well, this is kind of this is kind of clear because we didn't have any. So if you go back to the equations of motion, we didn't have any translational diffusion. So you see, initially your your velocity is fixed, and then only slowly starts deviating. So initially you just go straight. Um, then um, but then you see it. Uh, the important parameter is gravity. If I change gravity by a little bit more than a factor of two, then you see the initial increase changes by orders of magnitude. Yeah? So we have sensitivity by two orders of magnitude upon tuning this parameter. 
Um, the long time behavior is, uh, is linear for all parameters. So it, eventually there will be diffusion in that sense. Um, at low gravity, you see again these oscillations here. And this is of course reminiscence of this circular drifted motion that we have. Yeah? So you oscillate and drift, so you get oscillations. Above the bifurcation, where the angle is essentially locked, all curves are monotonic. Now, um, once you have the variance, you can calculate the diffusion coefficient by, so I define the diffusion coefficient as the long time increase of the variance. Yeah, you can take a derivative or just divide by t and take this limit for large time. And I plotted this in the following way. I, uh, normalize this diffusion coefficient in terms of the diffusion coefficient of the free circle swimmer. This is what I calculated earlier. And this means that all curves are pinned to this value here. Why do I do this? Well, the point is if I don't have any fluctuations, then the system is deterministic, it's non chaotic, there is no variance. Yeah, there's no variance, and in that sense, there's no diffusion. So I have to normalize it with something. So I normalize it with the, essentially the noise that I put in. And now I switch on, um, and now I switch on gravity. This is this one here. So they're all pinned here. Then for large orientational diffusion, um, for large, so that is for low quality factor if you want. Um, this looks rather boring. Now I decrease the orientational diffusion. And then what you see is that there is a resonance emerging so this uh, picture becomes sharper and sharper if you decrease the rotational noise. This, this is the only noise that I put. So there's a resonance emerging close to this bifurcation if the rotational diffusion goes down. Well, the first thing that you can do if you have such, uh, such a phenomenon is like, you can ask how does the maximum uh, depend on the parameters as the rotational diffusion goes to zero. This is extracted here in this inset. I think I still have the wrong, no, this should be right. So it's plotted as a function of the inverse rotational diffusion coefficient and you empirically find a power law here. Great. And when we first had, so this was done by my postdoc at the time, Alexander Chipisco, he said, this is great, we should write a PRL on that. I said, no, we have to, understand this first, where does this resonance come from? Yeah? So we have to understand the resonance. This is the goal now. To, uh, uh, yeah. So at resonance, how do they behave? The, what, the l shape swimmer at the resonance point, what is their behavior? This is, the, this is the maximum here. This is the maximum. So I extract for each curve the maximum of this curve and plot them here as an inverse function. So you see that this increases upon decreasing the rotational diffusion. Uh, I mean, uh, so do they like oscillate at very high um, frequency or? Um, so it, um, it turns, so you see the, uh, the resonance is close to the bifurcation where the angle is locked or almost locked. Yeah, so it's not really that they do the circular motion. The circular motion they do, they do for small groups. So this is the circular motion and this is the locked phase. Yeah? This is the locked phase and the resonance is always on the locked side, but close to the bifurcation. And if you look at individual trajectories, you don't see a lot, actually. This is unfortunate. Okay. Actually, when we speak about resonance, uh, something like uh, higher amplitude oscillation, something like that, right? So, which associated with a higher energy or? Um, I don't know what you mean by energy. Uh, I mean, when something is in resonance, you in so I, so you may call it whatever you like. I call it a resonance because this has a typical shape of a resonance that you know from the harmonic oscillator, from atomic physics, or whatever. Yeah? By resonance, I mean just that you get a sharp peak. The width of the peak becomes arbitrarily small, uh, so you can enhance this resonance as as much as you like. This is why I call it a resonance. Yeah? So. Um, the name resonance comes in many fields, classical physics, quantum physics. Okay. okay, so we want to understand this analytically. Let's go back to our equation, to the Fokker-Planck equation, which you have seen now 
several times. So we have, this is the probability to displace by R, seeing a final angle theta at leg time T, provided I started at an initial angle theta zero. The system is still translationally invariant, not rotationally invariant. Yeah? This is no longer true because we have gravity. Yeah? Now, the Fokker-Planck equation changes in the following way. So we still have orientational diffusion. We still have angular drift, but we have this aligning torque of gravity. And then we have the active propulsion. I suppressed all terms of the translational diffusion. So this we discarded from the model. Again, first thing we do is the spatial Fourier transform. This derivative just gets a factor of minus i i k. This is p tilde solves this equation of motion now. Um, for future reference, this operator I will call the, the splits naturally in a term L or L0 and a term that contains the K, this I call delta LK. So this will be my perturbing operator. What is the solution now of the intermediate scattering function? So I want still to calculate this average of the exponential. So I pick an initial angle and now I have to be careful because now my system is no longer isotropic. So I pick my initial angle from the stational probability distribution that I have derived by other means. So in all other cases, we just had a factor one over two pi because all angles were equally likely. This is no longer true. So I have to pick them from the stationary distribution. Then I let time, so I want to average this. This is already done by the spatial Fourier transform. Then I let time evolve and then I sum over all final angles. So the only difference to before is that I have to average with respect to the stationary distribution. Now, um, again, there's, I, mean, there's, I mean, there are several ways to solve it. One is to just put this blindly on the computer and try to solve this numerically. I want to uh, use uh, more advanced techniques, techniques that you're all familiar with from elementary quantum mechanics. So I set up a Hilbert space of all periodic square integrable functions and I define the standard scalar product in that way. Um, then any fun uh, uh, then there's an abstract isomorphism, so I can write any function by this uh, overlap of theta and f, and I can introduce a basis in this Hilbert space, and the basis will be just complex exponentials. Yeah? So any two pi periodic function can be expanded in complex exponentials that are in this fancy notation this way. Now, with respect to the scalar product, I can associate to every operator matrix. How do I do this? Well, I let this operator act on some basis state and then resolve it with a new basis state. So this becomes a matrix here. And in a parquet notation, this is this object. I can calculate this for our special operator. And you see that this matrix is, contains terms on the diagonal and terms only to the diagonal next to the diagonal. So, so it's almost, so it's a tri-diagonal matrix. It's almost diagonal already. Now we have also this perturbing operator, uh, same scheme. And you find again, this uh, has elements only, this, this is tri-diagonal. This is a tri-diagonal matrix that you can easily diagonalize. The computer. You have to be a little bit careful because it's non-hermission. Because what do you, or both are non-Hermitian, what would you expect of a Hermitian matrix? So in particular, all diagonal elements should be real. This is not the case due to this angular drift. Second, you want that the, that the off-diagonal uh, elements are, are, are complex conjugate to each other once you flip along the diagonal. And also, this is no longer true. So this matrix is no longer Hermitian. You can still hope to diagonalize it by introducing left and right eigenvalues. So I call the right eigen vectors, I call these R. Uh, lambda is the eigen, uh, eigen, eigen value, and the same for the left one, and you can write the left one in terms of the adjoint. So L is for the left eigen state. Now, what do I want to do? Uh, so the first claim is I know one state for sure. And I name I know there will be always a stationary state. This corresponds to eigenvalue zero. Yeah? Time doesn't there's no time evolution. So for, for um, so the right eigenvalue, eigenstate is just a stationary distribution. What about the left eigenstate? But the left eigenstate, what do I need to do? I think it's seen most basically here. So 
the left, I have to use the adjoint operator, which is by taking derivatives to the left. I say, ah, this is great because there are always partial derivatives here to the left. So a constant does the job. Yeah? So if I take a constant, and let this operate the adjoint and operate everything to the left, then it just kills the constant. So a constant does the job. So I choose this constant P1. So the left and right eigenstate for eigenvalue zero corresponding to the stationary state are known. Now I write my, my, uh, my um, intermediate scattering function in a fancy way. So this is the fancy way of writing the stationary state where I picked my initial angle from. And I cheated in, or as I put in this factor here, which is just unity. And now you can see, ah, I, this is basically a completeness relation here, this one here and this one here. So in essence, what I need to calculate is the complex exponential of uh, this matrix element of the complex, or, sorry, of this exponential between left and right eigenstate of the stationary state. Great. Assume now that I have the intermediate scattering function, I can generate the moments. Uh, so here's a minus sign missing. I should correct this. Here's a minus sign missing. Um, and here's a C dot missing. So there are two typos here. Um, so you see, in a long wavelength expansion, small k expansion, I can generate the mean motion and the mean square motion. And from this, I can obtain the value. OK. So what I really want to do is, I want to have this object, I want to do a perturbative approach in small k. We had this already yesterday. I said, yeah, yeah, you can generate the low order moments by just expanding this in orders of k, but I didn't tell you how to do this. Now I, I fill in this gap. So the trick is the following. So we want to have the exponential of this operator part. Maybe I should fill in here. So this is time derivative, and this is this exponential. You can solve this immediately. The solution is e to the uh, uh, exponential of this operator acting on, uh, on uh, so the solution is just the exponential. This is this one here. That's what you saw here, the exponential of the total operator times t. Now, how to do now a small k expansion? What I really want to do, k appears only in this perturbing operator. The uh, L was independent of k. So what I need to do is perturbation theory. This is time-dependent perturbation theory, as you did in quantum mechanics. And the good starting point is the Dyson representation. So you can write this operator here in this funny uh, operator identity. So this is the exponential of the unperturbed operator. Then we have the exponential of the unperturbed operator, the perturbed operator, and the exponential of the full operator. And now you can say, ah, I can use this result to replace this object here by the full equation again and iterate. This gives rise to the so-called Born series. Yeah? So this is born second order born perturbation theory. That's why I truncate here. It's a second order. It's a born series. This I'm going to use because I want to sandwich this operator between the stationary states. So this is the next slide. And I make use of the properties that the, that the right eigenscape to eigenvalue zero is stationary. And similarly, the left one remains unaffected by the adjunct. Now, this is just copy paste of the Born series. I just sandwiched all operators between left and right eigenstate zero. It's just copy paste. I make use now that the right eigenscape is uh, time independent, so this doesn't contribute. And I let this one act to the left. It's also time dependent. So you see all time dependence of this matrix element drops out. Um, and I just integrate over time, so this exists linearly. So here I do the same. This one doesn't contribute because this, um, the right eigenstate is time invariant. This one is time invariant, protect uh, done on the left. Here. I still have a problem. So here I insert a complete set of eigenstates, of this right and left eigenstate, by doing a sum over all lines. But now you see I can perform, uh, uh, I, I can simplify, because I know how this operator acts on the right eigenstates, just reproduces the exponential of the eigenvalue. Yeah? So the operator acts in each eigenstate just by replacing it by the eigenvalue minus the eigenvalue half. So this is an exact representation. And now you see time appears only in this exponentials here. 
so I can perform all integrals, and this is the result. Great. So we have a formal result for the long wavelength expansion of the intermediate scattering function. In particular, I can read off the terms that are proportional to k that gives us the drift term. So this is the drift along the direction of n. So I choose n as the direction of k. So this is the drift velocity along, uh, along n. And this is the variance now. So after um, doing this with this term together, I get the variance. So I get this formula here. Okay. So this is an exact result. And now let's look at the full lines and compare them to the simulation. And they nicely agree, at least after some iterations with the postdoc. So if they don't agree, then either the simulation is wrong or the analytics is wrong or both. And it turned out initially both were wrong, but now both are right. right? So they nicely describe the data. Um, and in particular, we can read off from the variance, we can read off the long time, the diffusion coefficient that is the long time behavior of the variance, say in some direction n. And this is the result from this formula. It just take long times. And the only one that survives is this term here. Okay, so, so and the full lines are the analytic theory for the diffusion. Oh, great. Now we got simulation and we got analytic theory. Now let's publish. I don't know. Because we haven't understood anything so far. Did we? I mean, we just used two different methods to solve the same equation. One by stochastic simulations and one by numerical methods to describe data. Where does the resonance come from? So this question still remains. So I ask you, and then I asked many times, and I never got a, an answer for it. So look at this formula. How, how do you think can this object flow? Look at this formula. So the k's just cancel out. So this is proportional to L. K is proportional to k. The k's just cancel out. So how can this explode? What comes to your mind? Well, there are three things that come to mind. One is, it could be that the sum is, becomes larger. So the, all terms are small, but the sum becomes large. Okay. It could be that the matrix elements become large, or that the eigenvalue becomes small. Well, the matrix elements, they are bounded. They cannot become large. About the sum, I don't really know. But we can look at the eigenvalues. We can just numerically look at the eigenvalues, what happens with the eigenvalues. And this is done here. So here I plot the first eigenvalue as a function of the noise, the rotational diffusion. And I do this in a smart way. So we said the resonance emerges close to the bifurcation. So I define a separation parameter, epsilon. That's the difference of gamma minus omega. And to make it dimensionless, I divide by omega. So this is kind of the distance to the bifurcation. This can be positive or negative, And I approach zero from both sides. And you see the following. If, so if n becomes large, I'm close to the bifurcation. For small n, you see the eigenvalue saturates if I decrease the noise. Now I go closer to the bifurcation. And blue and red is above and below the bifurcation. I don't remember which one. Now I go closer to the bifurcation. So you see I decrease the noise. And the eigenvalue becomes smaller, both above and below the noise. I still go closer. And you see the eigenvalue becomes Smaller, smaller. These are logarithmic scales. Yeah? So the eigenvalue becomes smaller and smaller as I approach the bifurcation. Yeah? And even more, you can see that all blue curves, they have kind of the same shape on logarithmic scales. And also the red curves, they have the same shape. So I can shift them and try to superimpose them. That's what I did here. And that's what we did here. So empirically, Shift up, down, right, left. Um, you get a master curve, one for the blue one that's above, and for the red ones below. And I don't remember which one. Yeah. And empirically, we find the following: the following scaling law, that we have to shift everything in the right direction with a rescaled uh, diffusion coefficient. This is this d rod uh, 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 decorated with the separation from the bifurcation. And we have to shift eigenvalues up and down with this factor square root of x. So, and this lambda, this is then the master curve. 
Yes, this, and this is true not only for the first eigenvalue, as I show you, but basically for all low-lying eigenvalues. And what you also see numerically is that these eigenvalues then approach a fixed value. They all approach n, uh, which is the, or they're proportional, sorry, they're proportional to n, which means the spectrum is equidistant. And this you know from quantum mechanics, this happens for the harmonic oscillator. Well, it happens for the quantum case, but this also happens for the noisy harmonic oscillator. So the spectrum is equidistant, just like in a harmonic oscillator. And this gives rise to a new idea. Let's try to make a harmonic approximation. Okay, so we make a harmonic approximation. So we look at small separation parameter. Now we are on the positive side, that is we are in the locked phase, where we have a minimum. If I expand my Langevin equation around, around the fixed point that we identified further, so this linearized version, this is a linear Langevin equation, and you can easily, so the first thing that you should see is that this relaxation time that enters here, this is just the difference between, so this object here, and this relaxation rate goes to zero as you approach the bifurcation. So this was the softening of the potential that I told you earlier, so the stiffness of the potential goes to zero, which means the relaxation rate goes to zero, or the relaxation time goes to infinity. Um, if you solve this, if you solve uh, for the eigenvalues of this equation, you find, yes, indeed, the eigenvalues are just equidistant, and they're just n over tau. Tau is this relaxation right here. And this fits nicely to what I showed you numerically. Now, so we explained the eigenvalues, and we ex explained that the eigenvalues scale like square root of epsilon, that's the distance to the bifurcation. So this is this, what I showed here. So this factor here is now explained, and still want to explain how to shift horizontally. Okay, so um, uh, let's go on with our harmonic approximation. So we look at the perturbing operator, and linearized again. So we continue with our harmonic approximation. So this was the perturbing operator, and, um, and u was just cosine and sine, and I linearize around the stationary value, so cosine theta star and sine theta star, and this is the perturbation. So this is for fixed angle, and this is for small angular perturbation. Now, let's good, go back to our master formula for the, say, the mean drift. So for the mean drift, we have to calculate the matrix element between, of the perturbing operator between the stationaries. You see, to leading order, this operator becomes, becomes just a number. It doesn't depend on the angle anymore. So this is a number, and this is just a stationary state. This is what we derived earlier in our classical approximation. So in, in ignoring all fluctuation, our particle just moves with a fixed orientation. What about, what about the, um, the diffusion coefficient? Now you see, aha, what we need here is our transition matrix elements. So we need transition matrix elements. So the constant doesn't contribute because lambda is always different from zero. So the constant drops out. So we need the, uh, we really need the matrix element of the angular fluctuations. But in a harmonic oscillator, Approximation, you know that, say, x, the x operator, has matrix elements only to the next excited, excited state, right? You remember this? So you can write, say, the x operator as a sum of a creation and annihilation operator. So you go either up or down, huh? which means there's only a single state that contributes. So we need the matrix, this matrix element and this matrix element. And the only way that you have a non-vanishing matrix element is if lambda is equals to one, that is the first excited state. So we need to keep only one excited state, and you can calculate the matrix. Look at this again. Of this sum, only the first excited state contributes in a harmonic approximation. So let's look how good we are doing. So this is the variance now within the harmonic approximation. So there's only one term. This is the full fine time dependence and everything. And the line that you see here is this black dotted line. 
And you see, if the noise becomes small, this nicely reproduces our, our results or the diffusion coefficient. And you can see somewhere also the black line, the black dotted line here, this holds for the full variance. So after this very complicated story, I get a master formula for the variance, which holds close to the bifurcation and consists of a single term uh, with this diffusion coefficient. Great. However, so uh, does this indeed diverge? So this diffusion coefficient here, you see, uh, we said tau goes to infinity close to the, to the bifurcation because the potential becomes soft. Huh? So this explains the divergent because the potential becomes soft. If you look at the data, then you see this black dotted line goes to infinity, but all maxima are actually finite. Huh? So they are finite. So it's never happening that you are coming. So we have to refine a little bit. Now, this picture holds only as long if the particle can, or the angle can relax within the minimum before it jumps over the barrier, right? So we get a very shallow minimum and we have a shallow barrier. So we need to make sure that the particle relaxes in the minimum before it jumps over the barrier. So let's estimate when this happens. So we need, so we compare Kramer's, or this is misspelled, Kramer's escape rate. We have to compare Kramer's escape rate, which is proportional to this exponential in the barrier. I evaluate this for close to the, uh, to the bifurcation and I get this result. And you see, the picture should hold if the barrier is large. But now we can read off this means that this, this factor here is uh, small. So here we get the scaling that we had earlier, this is the scaling that how I needed to shift my curves horizontally to get data color. So see from the scaling law, I explained now not only this factor, but I explained also this factor here. So the scaling is rationalized within this harmonic approximation. Now, the last, and here I'm always getting a little bit confused, is um, what is what now about the maximal enhancement? For the maximal enhancement, we should have, um, we are on the, on the localized side and the reduced rotational coefficient should be, uh, should be, uh, or sh could, should not exceed one. So I put this to one, which means that D rod scales proportional to epsilon to the three over two. Now D max would be then D max over D zero. D zero becomes essentially D rod. So this D rod drops out. So this goes like T squared. T squared goes like one over epsilon, but one over epsilon, uh, if the rod hat is something like one, scales like the rod to the minus two over three. This is this law here. This is the law here that we had earlier. So we also explain the scaling of the maximum as a function or, uh, of the noise as the noise goes up. Okay, now I'm over time. Um, which is what, uh, which is a pity because I worked so hard to show you also that you can solve one more problem, namely the harmonic oscillator. So you solve the harmonic oscillator, I've just flashed the equation. So you have now a harmonic restoring force in addition to the self-propulsion and some noise, and here I neglect, uh, neglect any uh, anisotropy. So this can be still solved, but I don't have time show it to you, but I will upload the slides. You can look it up. So let me then conclude. So I showed you exact solutions of, for the circle swimmer, for the intermediate scattering function, in terms of new functions, which I call generalized Mathieu functions. This intermediate scattering function displays now a non-trivial plateau non-trivial oscillations, which is precisely um, uh, rationalized in terms of the circular motion. For this problem of gravitaxis, we had a formal solution of the Fokker-Planck equation uh, in terms of left and right eigenstates. Uh, we could generate the low order moments like the drift and the variance. And we observed in particular a resonance close to, class close to the classical bifurcation for small noise. And everything can be understood in terms of a harmonic, or, uh, harmonic object approximation. And for this part, I didn't have time. So I 
like to close for today, and I'm looking forward to questions. So uh, maybe for the interest of time, ask one question and then take the tea coffee outside and write and ask the question, more questions. Yes. So my question was regarding the circles, circular swimmer. So in that uh, you had this uh, effective uh, diffusion, which was the uh, diffusion plus some term. Yeah. in which the bias was in the denominator. Yeah. So if, uh, yeah. yeah, so like uh, if the bias is very high, that means it's just an effective diffusion, right? Yeah, so, um, so if, if, uh, if this omega becomes really large, then, then you only see the, the translational diffusion because you're basically, you're rotating so fast that you don't get anywhere. You know? So then you don't get uh, uh, then you don't get an additional contribution. Then you have just the mean diffusion. If you're rotating, if your active propulsion just tells you you are rotating all the time, then you don't get anywhere, and it's only the kicks that you get from the solvent by the passive translational diffusion that matters. That's right. Yeah. Go out for tea and coffee, and then you can ask more questions to Professor Tranos.